That's one issue that we picked up. And in the, in the case, the Slovenian case, which has just been appealed to the Court of Arbitration of Sport by the UCI, the allegation was um, merely that oxygen transfer enhancement is a prohibited method and nothing else needed to be proven. So it was even, it was quite broad, the allegation in itself. Now what the UCI, what the, the statement from the panel said in the Valuebet case was that the expert panel, well, the opinion of the expert panel convincingly proved to doping we see this as an error in the way that the evidence has been presented. The error that it raises is this, what's known as the prosecutor's fall fallacy. And the expert's error lay in confusing two different questions, namely what is the probability of finding the evidence given that the defendant is innocent, and what is the probability that the defendant is, is innocent given the evidence. Now, that's not, it's not too easy to get your head around that, it took me a little while. But, Look at it this way. What is the probability that an animal has four legs, given that it is a cow? What is the probability that an animal is a cow, given that it has four legs? So one of these is correct and one of these is incorrect in law. So the difference between the two ways of framing the evidence of the expert's opinion can be seen if we frame the statements in terms of the biological passport. What is the probability of the abnormal blood value, given the for example, given the athlete has been at altitude? Or, what is the probability of the abnormal blood value given the athlete has blood doped? This is how we say the evidence should be presented to the hearing by, by the experts. What they're doing at the moment is points two and four there, which are the reverse. These are examples of the pro prosecutor's fallacy. So statements one and three, sorry, one and three are permissible, and two and four are impermissible in a court of law. <coughs> So what we're saying is it confuses two different questions. What is the probability of finding the evidence given the defendant is innocent with what is the probability that the defendant is innocent given the evidence? What the panel's been doing up to date is this. Rather than presenting the evidence as a likelihood of guilt, or I'm sorry, rather than presenting the evidence likelihoods based upon the evidence. What they're doing is presenting a likelihood of guilt. That is the prosecutor's fallacy. The statement in Valuevac, again, it convincingly proves that there is no other reasonable explanation for the athlete's blood profile. What we're saying in the report is this usurps the role of the decision maker, whether it's a court, a SADA, CAS, or whoever. They need to make this decision, and it's not for the scientific experts to make decisions about guilt. So we need to separate the, role, the, the different roles of the people. The experts give an opinion on the evidence and it's for the people conducting the hearing to decide if somebody's guilt, guilty or not. One of the other things that we think is important, that rather than giving it a, a hypothesis on, um, on blood doping, for example, all the different Possible hypotheses need to be uh, addressed by the expert panel. So they must, for example, here we've just sort of gone through some of the, the, the normal sorts of errors that could arise. The hypothesis one, the hypothesis doped one, is it, it's blood doped. What's, what's the likelihood of that? Two is that it was EPO. Three is the sub, well, one, one A and one B are a subset of the blood doped transfusion. Then you've got the not, not doped hypotheses, the altitude, hyperoxic tents, pathological conditions, illness, a sample collection error, instrument quality error, statistical software error. So what we're saying is the experts need to address each and every one of these possibilities in the evidence that they give toward in, in a hearing for an ADVR. And the way that this sort of Evidence based upon statistics should be given is these what are called likelihood ratios. And here we have the, the examples of the numerical and the verbal likely the verbal equivalents. And this is from a work by Ian Freckleton, who's probably the the uh, well, the most the leading author on expert evidence in Australia, barrister, um, and 
adjunct professor at um, uh, Deakin University Law School as well. And however, if you look at the, the likelihood ratios that come out of the Lusard lab, there's the, the, the first one there, the 0 0.9980 to 0.9990, is not expressed as of limited support, moderate support, strong support, or very strong support, it's expressed, as you can see, as practically proven. And so what we see is from the very beginning, this sort of prosecutor's fallacy is embedded in the process. Um, here are some of the ways that we suggest the um, expert's evidence should be given. In my opinion, there is moderate support for the likelihood of the abnormal blood value given that the athlete has been at altitude or rather than the form as I've got in, in, in used in Bayback, the case of blood doping has been proven given the evidence. So again, the correct form should be there is a moderate possibility of the abnormal blood values given the athlete has spent time at altitude, or there is a strong possibility of the abnormal blood values given the athlete has taken EPO. And this is uh, myself trying to learn statistics here trying to pose the question in the correct form, in um, statistical form, and class who will speak next, next a quote from one of his articles, which says, formal logic dictates that the forensic scientists can only make statements about the likelihood of the evidence given the hypothesis. I won't read it all, you can see it there. And what the, the point that class makes that we, we agree with in the report is that if you do it in the manner that it should not be framed, that is the prosecutor's fallacy, you're usurping the role of the judge or jury. 